10 Strangest Mysteries Solved Decades After the Cops Gave Up The only thing more intriguing than a nice cold case is one that eventually thaws. Here are 10 of the longest-running cold cases that were finally solved, many times through sheer perseverance, and sometimes through a touch of luck. 1. Diane Maxwell Jackson The word Houston evoked intense anxiety for James Ray Davis. According to Houston police, he had a dark past here a crime that had gone unsolved for almost 34 years. He was more than happy to ease into a life of relative obscurity. After all, Davis, 58, had been a model citizen since his release from prison a decade ago. The unemployed man was quietly enjoying his freedom, living by himself in a federally funded housing complex in Texarkana on the Texas-Arkansas border. That came to an abrupt end Monday when he was arrested and charged with the 1969 murder of a Texas Ranger's sister who was raped and stabbed on her way to work in downtown Houston. The death of Diane Maxwell Jackson, a 25-year-old single mother, might have remained unsolved forever had it not been for her brother, David Maxwell, who asked Houston police to renew their investigation into the case several months ago. The arrest was just as though a big weight had been lifted off my shoulders, said Maxwell a ranger whose jurisdiction includes Brazoria and Matagorda counties. My thoughts were about my parents. Being able to go to my parents and tell them that at long last, the murder had been solved. Maxwell gives all the credit to Houston homicide investigators. Using a combination of preserved evidence and technological advances, police zeroed in on Davis, who had never before been considered a suspect. Davis was arrested because police said his finger and palm prints matched those found on the slain woman's car. Matching the prints, however, wasn't easy. The prints, which an HPD employee found incorrectly stored in the 1984 archives after more than a month of searching, did not match anything in the HPD's fingerprint database since Davis had never been arrested by Houston police said HPD-laden print examiner Debbie Benningfield. The state's database contained only Davis' thumb prints, she said. After searches in the Houston Police Department and state databases turned up empty, the matching prints police needed to solve the case were found in the FBI's automated fingerprint identification system, which went online three years ago. HPD does not have access to the FBI's fingerprint database, so the Department of Public Safety searched the National Library on the police department's behalf, Benningfield said. That provided Benningfield a candidate list, and from there she made the match. On December 14, 1969, Jackson was killed after she was forced into a shack behind an abandoned service station at Jefferson and Austin. Several months ago, police did their best to sound optimistic when Maxwell asked them to take another look at the case. But the only witness had been dead for 10 years. Investigators' only hope was the three fingerprints and a partial palm print recovered from Jackson's Ford Mustang which was stolen and dumped nearby. Since anyone walking by the car could have touched it, police would need a confession. On Monday, Davis was friendly when homicide investigators knocked on his door, inviting them inside. But as officers narrowed their questions to his activities in 1969 and 1970, then revealed they were from Houston, Davis was visibly shocked, they said. He was definitely nervous, said HBD Homicide Sergeant Jim Ramsey the lead investigator. In fact, I handed him a photo of Jackson's car, and he acted like he didn't want to touch it. Davis eventually confessed to the slaying but didn't admit to the rape, police said. He agreed to go to the Texarkana Police Department so authorities could take a good set of palm prints and a math swab. Police let him go and kept him under surveillance until they could get an arrest warrant. Because Davis didn't want the embarrassment of being arrested in front of his neighbors, police allowed him to surrender at a parking lot a block away, Ramsey said. Davis had been in and out of Texas prisons since 1961, for crimes such as possession of stolen property, vehicle theft and burglary, records show. After he was released from prison in Huntsville, nine days before Jackson's slaying, he stayed in a Houston hotel in Preston, Ramsey said. One month after Jackson was killed, Davis was arrested for auto theft and eventually sent back to prison. Police say they don't suspect Davis in any other slayings. Davis was arrested in 1976 in Waco for a similar attempt at abduction, police said, that earned him another stint in prison. Davis was granted clemency and freed from prison in July 1992. He'd had no other troubles with the law until his arrest Monday, Ramsey said. The 2. 
the hideous Chicago triple child murder that was finally solved, after 40 years, maybe it was the memory of the old man opening his door, and asking if John Rotuno was there to talk about the decades-old murders of the old man's son and two other boys, or maybe it was Mr. Rotuno's belief that the man he helped put in prison, for the murders had not done nearly enough time had not suffered nearly enough for what he had done before he died this week in prison. Whatever it was, Mr. Rotuno, a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, who helped lead the investigation, choked up Friday while talking about the murders of 14-year-old Robert Peterson, 13-year-old John Schusler and his 11-year-old brother, and Dan Schusler. I wish he would have stayed in longer just to linger, just to stay there, Mr. Rotuno said of the man, 74-year-old Kenneth Hansen, who died Wednesday at Pontiac Correctional Center. Still, he said, it's done. It's closed. Mr. Hansen's death put an end to a criminal case that has been part of the city's history for more than a half century. In October 1955, the boys disappeared. Their naked bodies were found later in a Cook County Forest Preserve. The case went unsolved for almost 40 years. Then, during the investigation of another long unsolved case, suspected horse killings and the mysterious 1977, disappearance of the candy heiress and horsewoman Helen Voorhees Bratch, Mr. Rotuno and his partner, Special Agent Jim Grady, came across people who implicated Mr. Hansen in the boys' slayings. In the summer of 1994, Mr. Hansen sensed the investigation was closing in on him, Mr. Rotuno said. He was asking a neighbor, are there any police around watching my house? Recalled Mr. Rotuno adding that Mr. Hansen had even packed a suitcase to leave town when Mr. Grady arrested him in August of that year. He was arrested on an arson charge in a 1972 fire at a suburban Chicago stable and charged later the same day with killing the boys. During Mr. Hansen's trial, prosecutors contended that the three boys were hitchhiking when they were picked up by Mr. Hansen, 22 at the time who took them to the stable where he worked. They said he sexually abused at least one of them and strangled them all. Mr. Hansen was convicted in 1995, but the Illinois Appellate Court overturned the conviction five years later after determining that the jury should not have heard evidence that Mr. Hansen had cruised the streets, picking up boys for sexual relations. Mr. Hansen went on trial again in 2002 and, after deliberating a little more than two hours, a jury found him guilty again. Mr. Hansen was sentenced to 200 to 300 years in prison. He maintained his innocence, said two lawyers who represented him, one of whom was working on another appeal at the time of his death. The case was as phony as could be, said Leonard Goodman, Mr. Hansen's former lawyer, who said he remained convinced of Mr. Hansen's innocence. Had Mr. Hansen been arrested shortly after the slayings, Mr. Goodman said, he thinks he surely would have had an alibi, but 40 years later it's very difficult to defend yourself. You can't say where you were on a particular day in October of 1955. Karen Daniel, a lawyer with the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern University, was working on an appeal that included the argument that Mr. Hansen should have been allowed to present evidence at his second trial that another man confessed to the slayings. Ms. Daniel said the only evidence was from people who testified that Mr. Hansen told them he had killed the boys. You can't allow people to be convicted on this type of evidence, she said. Though the appeal was still active, Mr. Goodman said Mr. Hansen had lost hope but he wanted to keep fighting for his kids so they wouldn't have to live with a blemish on their name. Mr. Rotuno, though, maintains that the evidence against Mr. Hansen was overwhelming and that the case against him was a deadlock. He also said that in the years before he was arrested, Mr. Hansen preyed on hundreds of boys. He added, I'm glad he's dead because now they can't say this or they can't say that. It's finally done. And say this. 3. Pamela Jackson and Cheryl Miller. The 1960 Studebaker Lark was in third gear, with the keys in the ignition and the lights on. One tire was damaged, and the remains of two girls, Pamela Jackson and Cheryl Miller, who disappeared in 1971, on their way to a party at a gravel pit in Union County were in the cab. Those details emerged on Tuesday, as Attorney General Marty Jackley announced that neither foul play nor alcohol were part of the mystery that started as a missing persons case and was investigated as a homicide in the early 2000s, 
based on jailhouse testimony that turned out to be false. The two teen girls who have been missing appear to have crashed the car off the gravel road nearly 43 years ago, landing under the bridge until low water levels in Barule Creek revealed the wheels of the Studebaker last year about five miles south of Elk Point and less than a mile from the gravel pit. All the evidence would appear to indicate an accident, Jack Lee said. The results put an end to speculation in the decades-long mystery and brings closure to two families who've wondered about the fate of the teens, Jack Lee said. This has really been a tragedy for two families, a tragedy for an entire class and a tragedy for all of South Dakota to some extent. He said, a witness familiar with the case called authorities last September to report seeing the Studebaker's wheels poking up out of the water. Initial attempts to pull the car from the creek were unsuccessful, sparking a slow and exhaustive exhumation process. On Tuesday, Jack Lee presented the results of the search. Miller's purse was found, Jack Lee said. Inside it was her license, notes from classmates and photographs. The remains had been sent to the University of North Texas Anthropology Department for DNA testing, after the State Division of Criminal Investigation dug out the evidence. The state had to submit further evidence to the university before the DNA tests could be returned, as well. The families declined to comment on the case Tuesday, but Jack Lee read a statement from them during the press conference. Our day has come through this journey for answers pertaining to our beloved sister Sherry and dear friend Pam. We will now be able to finish the last chapter of this journey, the statement said. With the help of all of our police forces, our family and friends, our family cannot thank you enough for the continued support you have given to us. We are now able to carry out our mother's last wish. Jack Lee also mentioned that Oscar Jackson died at age 102, and didn't know what happened with the disappearance of his daughter, Pam Jackson. The closure is now complete for the Jackson and Miller families, but another family was drawn into the fray a decade ago. Six years ago, prosecutors indicted a state prison inmate on murder charges in the case of Jackson and Miller, who last were seen driving the car May 29, 1971. Both were 17. Charges against convicted rapist David Lipkin were dropped when prosecutors learned a jailhouse informant had falsified a taped confession with the help of another inmate. Investigators went to the Lipkin family farm in Union County in 2004, digging holes looking for personal effects of the girls. Jack Lee said Tuesday that the search was controversial, but that it withstood challenges in federal court. With that said, it's unfortunate that when we are searching, we disrupt things and we affect lives, Jack Lee said. Jack Lee told the Lickens attorney, Mike Butler, that the state would be returning whatever evidence still remains to the Lickens family. Butler said the mistake should have been clear from the beginning. The voice on the supposedly tape-recorded jailhouse confession from David Lickens didn't sound a thing like David Lickens. Lickens' past made him an easy target, Butler said. To me, it was clear-cut. Butler said, it's not enough to say we were doing our jobs. The problem was that they didn't do their jobs. The search was ruled legal by the courts, he said, but that doesn't excuse the sloppy detective work that called into question the character of an innocent, law-abiding family because of their relation to an incarcerated man. What happened to these two girls was tragic, but it was a car accident, Butler said. Kerwin Licken, David Licken's brother, was at the news conference on Tuesday, but wasn't satisfied with Jack Lee's appraisal of the search and investigation. I just wanted an apology from Marty, but I didn't get one, Kerwin Lipkin said. Kerwin Lipkin was angry when he confronted Jack Lee Tuesday, but he said later that he hopes that people understand why. He and his family were evacuated from their farm for five days in a search that cast a negative light on them, he said. His son didn't go to school for two weeks because of teasing from his classmates. How would you feel if it had happened to your family? Kerwin Lipkin said. My 84-year-old mother, now 94, couldn't go home. He also says that he was interrogative and threatened with a capital murder charge himself, despite assurances from law enforcement to the public that the search was only about David. He says the family would have never filed their $400,000 lawsuit if the Attorney General's office would have apologized for their mistake. Despite his continuing frustration, Kerwin Lipkin says the news of the accident does bring needed closure for the Miller and Jackson families. I do feel for the family and I'm glad they have an answer. It was a tragic thing, he said. Within a week of when this all started happening in 2004, I went to the Jackson family and told them we had nothing to do with it. 4.
Richard Phillips and Milton Curtis, a businessman was sentenced Monday to a pair of life terms after he admitted murdering two El Segundo police officers in 1957, and offered a teary-eyed apology to the families of his victims. I do not understand why I did this, said Gerald F. Mason, 69, who was caught when an old fingerprint from the crime scene matched his in a new FBI national database. I detest these crimes. I still do not want to remember what happened. Mason, 69, of South Carolina, asked for forgiveness for the killings of Milton Curtis, 25, and Richard Phillips, 28. Please believe I am still looking for ways to express my remorse for the horror I have caused, he said in court. That did not impress Keith Curtis, Milton Curtis' son. He says he's sorry now, but he hasn't been for the past 46 years. He's only sorry now because he got caught, the younger Curtis said, standing in the courtroom surrounded by El Segundo officers, prosecutors and family members. Mason, a retired gas station owner entered the plea during his first court appearance in Los Angeles since his arrest January 29 in Columbia, SC, where he has lived a quiet life since the killings. Curtis and Phillips were shot three times each on July 22, 1957, shortly before 1.30 a.m., after they pulled Mason over for running a red light. About an hour and a half before, prosecutors said, Mason robbed two 15-year-old girls and their dates at gunpoint in a Hawthorne Lover's Lane and raped one of the girls. Mason's attorney, Gaston Ferry, said his client accepted what he had done and wanted to save the victims the pain of testifying. Ferry said his client had written the statement he read in court. Mason's case, assembled by sheriff's investigators, led to disclosures that the Los Angeles Police Department has more than 6,000 prints from unsolved homicides that have not been forwarded to the FBI's computers for comparison. The Board of Police Commissioners is considering how best to correct the problem. Los Angeles County Dist. Attorney Steve Cooley said Mason had little choice in the case, given the evidence, which included the fingerprint lifted from the getaway car, handwriting records tying him to the murder weapon and three witnesses. In his dying act, Phillips marked his killer for life said Deputy Dist. Attorney Darren Levine. One of the three bullets the officer fired into the getaway car struck Mason, he said. When detectives arrested him, they discovered a telltale scar on his back. In Los Angeles Superior Court on Monday, the officer's children told Mason he had scarred them for life. Your cowardly act shattered our lives forever, said Carolyn Phillips, the daughter of Richard Phillips. You caused our mother to become a widow with three babies to raise alone. There is no way to describe our pain. Phillips said, There is no way to describe the emptiness and anguish we have felt all our lives without Dad. We cannot and will not forgive you. Keith Curtis, who noted that his sister died last year without seeing her father's killer brought to justice, said, Gerald Mason, your family may be shocked, but my family has been devastated. Los Angeles County Sheriff Lee Baca, whose investigators made the case against Mason, attended. While advances in technology were key, Baca also credited generations of investigators who ultimately brought Mason to justice. I thought this day would never come, said Sheriff's Deputy Howard Speaks, now 88, who had dusted the 1949 Ford for prints. Sheriff's forensic experts reviewing the case last September combined two partial prints of the same finger from the Ford steering wheel and submitted the result to the FBI. The match was from a 1956 burglary conviction. Sheriff's detectives Dan McElderry and Kevin Lowe said that match allowed them to make the connection with evidence gathered shortly after the crime. The evidence was presented to Mason's lawyer before he entered the plea. In 1960, a Manhattan Beach resident called police to report the discovery of a watch and a chrome-plated revolver behind a house. The police then found a second watch, and both watches were identified as belonging to the Hawthorne victims. The rare, nine-shot, Harrington and Richardson.22 revolver was identified as the murder weapon. It had been purchased four days before the killings in a Shreveport, La, Sears store, where the buyer gave the name G.D. Wilson and a fictional Miami address. A day earlier at a YMCA across the street, the registry had been signed by George D. Wilson, also of Miami. Prosecutors said they had expert evidence that the handwriting on the registry name was the same as on Mason's 1999 South Carolina driver's license application and on an automobile bill of sale. When detectives served a search warrant on Mason's Columbia home after his arrest in January, they found in his gun collection another error 9-shot.22 revolver. In addition, 
Investigators found three witnesses who identified Mason from a 1956 photograph as the man they had seen the night of the murders. El Segundo officers Charles Porter and James Gilbert, who had briefly stopped to assist Curtis and Phillips but left when everything appeared all right, said Mason was the man they had seen. Prosecutors said a news reporter, who went to the murder scene, told detectives that Mason was the man he recalled asking him for a ride near the scene. The 1957 law under which Mason was convicted allows him to be considered for parole, after a minimum of seven years in prison. Cooley said Mason will never see the light of day. You can run, but you cannot hide, Porter said in court after the plea. Kill an officer and we'll get you, no matter how long it takes. 5. Lucy Johnson When investigators in 1965, found out Lucy Johnson had been missing since 1961, they were convinced she'd been murdered. But Johnson's daughter, a Surrey, British Columbia, woman named Linda Evans, recently discovered that Johnson was alive and well in the Yukon, more than 52 years after her disappearance. Evans says she was just seven or eight when her mother vanished from her Surrey home in 1961, NBC News reports. But her father, Marvin, didn't report her disappearance until 1965, prompting an investigation into possible homicide and Marvin even being considered a suspect. For the past 52 years, Evans had assumed that her mother was dead. I'm still walking around in shock, Evans told the Surrey leader, I thought she was dead because there's been no contact. Nothing. Evans has since learned that Johnson, now 77, is alive and living in the Yukon and that she has four half-siblings. The search for Johnson reignited in June when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police featured her disappearance as one of its oldest unsolved missing persons cases, the Surrey Leader reports. After seeing an article on it, Evans decided to do some detective work of her own, taking out ads in a British Columbia newspaper and researching on the internet. We received a phone call from a woman in the Yukon who claimed that she had seen the picture of the missing person in the free newspapers and said the missing person we were looking for was actually her mother, Surrey RCMP spokesperson Corporal Bert Pocket told the CBC. Soon after, police confirmed that Johnson had a second family in Yukon. Despite her mother's unexplained disappearance, Evans told the Surrey leader that she isn't holding a grudge. I just hope I can be part of her life, Evans said. I'll just give her a big hug and hope the words come easy. 6. Martha Jean Lambert Authorities in Northeast Florida say they've closed the 24-year-old case of a missing 7th grader, but the girl's mother says she doesn't believe it. Martha Jean Lambert vanished near her street, Augustine home on November 27, 1985. Her mother, Margaret Pitchin, says she remains convinced that the 12-year-old girl was kidnapped. However, the street, Johns County Sheriff's Office said Friday that Pitchin's son David Lambert has confessed to accidentally killing his sister in an argument. Sergeant Chuck Mulligan said Lambert told police that he panicked and buried the girl in a shallow grave. Lambert was 15 at the time. The state attorney's office decided not charge Lambert with manslaughter after prosecutors considered his age at the time. The statute of limitations manslaughter charges had in 1985 and other mitigating circumstances, Mulligan said. Investigators had considered Lambert a suspect, but they had no evidence nor a confession, until Sheriff's Detectives Sean Tice and Howard Cole III reopened the case in June. Lambert, now 38, had previously told investigators that he last saw his sister as she walked off to play. When Tice and Cole interviewed him again last summer, Lambert told them he and Martha Jean were arguing near the old Florida Memorial College site over $20 he refused to give her, the detective said. The girl punched him in the face, and Lambert said he shoved her backward. Her head landed on a piece of metal sticking out of the ground, he told the detectives. D. Lambert stated when he lifted Martha up there was a large hole in the back of her head and blood was pouring out, Tice wrote in the offense report. D. Lambert stated he initially called out for help hoping that someone would be walking by and hear his cries. Lambert told the detectives that he dug a hole three feet deep and laid Martha Jean in it. He was terrified, Tice told the street. Augustine record. He was terrified of his mama. Still is. Pitchin says the sheriff's office just wants the case closed. Authorities still haven't found her daughter's remains. Though crews searched the site Lambert indicated in his recent interviews, demolition at the site over the past 24 years is believed to have removed or scattered any remains that may have existed, 
Sheriff's officials said, Pigeon told the Florida Times Union that Lambert makes up tales to get attention. Mulligan said investigators believe Lambert is telling the truth. We certainly understand the complexity and the difficulties these situations bring on a family. Mulligan said, these are his words, Martha Jean's disappearance was the county's longest running missing person investigation. 7. Minnie and Edward Moran, Washington state officials have apparently solved the 1985, cold case homicide of an elderly couple with an arrest that fulfills a grieving son's promise to his parents. Wilhelmina Minnie Moran and Edward Ed Moran's dead bodies were found Christmas Eve 1985. They had been shot to death and dragged into a wooded area. At their funeral, I laid my hand on their casket and I said, I will find out who did this. The couple's son, Dennis Hadler, said at a news conference Monday. A team of investigators from the Lewis County Sheriff's Office in Chehalis, Washington, was dispatched to Alaska July 8 to make an arrest in connection to the slayings. Rick Griff, 53, of King Salmon, Alabama, was arrested and will be processed for extradition back to Washington to stand trial for what Lewis County Sheriff Steve Mansfield called horrific crimes. Many and Ed Morin were 83 and 81 years old, respectively, when they were reported missing by family members December 19, 1985. The family became worried when the couple were not home as planned, for a family Christmas party, according to police. The next day, witnesses reported to police they spotted the Marin's car and authorities found a large amount of blood stains and the keys were in the ignition, police said. When the investigation into their murders opened, several witnesses reported seeing the car at the Sterling Savings and Loan Bank. We have developed evidence that Rick and his now deceased brother, John Riff, kidnapped the Marins from their residence and drove them to the bank forcing Ed to withdraw $8,500 in cash, Mansfield wrote in a news release. Five days after their disappearance, the couple's bodies were found in a wooded area at the end of the road in Chihuahua. The investigation revealed that they had been shot inside their car with a shotgun and then dragged to a wooded location where they were found by a passerby, according to police. Mansfield said the Riff brothers were their primary suspects from the beginning of their investigation but they did not have evidence of probable cause until much later on. Detectives feel many witnesses did not come forward during the time of the initial investigation due to being fearful of the Riff brothers and possible retaliation for speaking out, Mansfield wrote in the news release. Both Riff brothers moved to Alaska in 1987, and John Riff died ironically the week before investigators bought tickets to travel to Alaska for the arrests. Police said, I believe in karma, these are bad, evil people. Mansfield said at Monday's news conference. The prosecutor in the case told ABC News Seattle affiliate Camo, that he did not plan to pursue the death penalty for Riff because of his failing health. The Morin, Hadler families suffered a horrific and tragic loss of their family members, and now will be able to see justice served, Mansfield wrote. For the Morin's family, the arrest provided long-sought closure. People should never give up hope, son Hadler said. There is always hope out there. 8. Jessica Lynn King. It was 18 years delayed, but today, in the middle of a packed Madison County courtroom, justice finally came for Jessica Lynn King. Marvin Lee Smith, a convicted felon formerly from the short north, stood up and admitted he raped and murdered the 15-year-old Westland High School cheerleader in 1991. Today, in a deal that spared his life and prevented a death penalty trial that was supposed to begin March 9, Smith pleaded guilty to a charge of aggravated murder with specifications of rape and kidnapping. Three judges sentenced him to 30 years to life in prison. Keen was struggling in school and at home back in 1991, so she was staying at Huckleberry House, a safe house and crisis center in Columbus for runaway and troubled teens. Smith snatched her from a Wineland Park bus stop about 6 p.m. March 15. Her body, wearing only a torn and twisted bra and one dirty sock, was found two days later at Foster Chapel Cemetery in Madison County. Prosecutors and defense attorneys recounted yesterday what Smith did. They say that once Smith got keen near the cemetery that Friday night after dark, she escaped. A trail of footprints in the mud, pieces of duct tape and her other sock marked her trail as she ran for her life. Eventually, Keen ran into a fence post and fell down. Then. Smith jerked a 70-pound tombstone out of the ground at an old grave and beat her with it until it split into two. Investigators found its two pieces, both stained with blood, thrown over the cemetery fence. Jessica's mother, Rebecca Smitley, 
left the courtroom yesterday as Sheriff Jim Sabin described the scene at the cemetery. Later, Smitley said she never gave up hope this day would come. I can still feel Jessica's heart beating as she ran for her life that day. Smitley said, I can see her hiding behind tombstones and I can hear her praying. She has never forgiven herself, I wasn't there. I wasn't there to protect Jess, to kiss away her pain. I couldn't save her. Smith had been charged with assaults against two Columbus women and was out on bond when Keen disappeared. He was never considered a suspect in her death. He eventually was convicted for the two Columbus attacks and served nine years in prison. While he was incarcerated, the law changed and, as a felon convicted of a violent crime, he had to submit a DNA sample for a state database. Meanwhile, Keane's case grew cold. Then last year, state crime lab technicians used new technology and found that Smith's DNA matched evidence from Keane's rape and murder. Agent Greg Costas of the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation and Sabin found Smith living in Burlington, and see. They went and got him to give up a new DNA sample just to be sure. Smith was indicted last May and extradited to Ohio to face charges. In court today, Smith said nothing on his own behalf. He dropped his shoulders and sobbed as Keane's family addressed him. But he never looked at them. Heather Tollett, Keane's older sister by four years, reminded him that he stole so much more than a young girl's life. Everything in my life is measured against her loss. Tollett said, time is marked before and after her death. I miss her so. 9. Cynthia Epps James Fountain seemed terrified when he called 911 to report a grisly discovery 18 years ago, stuffed inside a wooden nightstand left in the backyard of his Montana Avenue home, he told the operator. He had found the chopped up body parts of a woman. Fountain, who had come off as meek and soft-spoken, cooperated with the investigation into the murder of Cynthia Epps a 29-year-old mother of two young daughters, according to police who probed the horrific 1994 murder. But last week, Buffalo's cold case squad detectives watched as the man who had seemed so shocked by the mutilated remains was arraigned in state Supreme Court on a charge of second-degree murder, accused of killing Epps and dismembering her body. He pleaded not guilty. Recently uncovered evidence led investigators to Fountain. More than a year ago, cold case detective Charles Aronica was sifting through unsolved cases involving the slayings of women in the early to mid-1990s. He was hoping that recent innovations in DNA technology might reveal new leads. The Epps case, from 1994, jumped out at Aronica. It had occurred during the city's worst year for homicides in modern times 92 killings. In contrast, there were 36 homicides reported in the city last year. Her murder was horrific, and I knew if we got evidence, that this might be the last cold case I reopened before retiring next year, Ironica said. They went over crime scene photographs to identify where they might still find DNA evidence that would lead them to the killer, and they gave Erie County Central Police Services Forensic Crime Lab official Paul Mazur a long list of items to be tested. Mazur put forensic biologist Michelle Lilly on the case. Months passed as Lilly conducted meticulous testing on the many pieces of evidence that were nearly two decades old. Finally, they got a break. DNA different from Epps was isolated. But whose was it? The cold case detectives already were suspicious that Fountain was the man they were looking for. Back in 1994, he had been ruled out after interviews determined he had not known Epps. Detectives had no reason to suspect Fountain had anything to do with it because he had no connection to her, Redmond explained. Investigators were left to assume Epps' body parts, wrapped in a green blanket and placed in a wooden nightstand had been randomly dumped in Fountain's backyard on the 100 block of Montana. But Ironica and Redman learned that four months after the June 1994, slaying of Epps, a resident of Goodyear Avenue who lived only a couple of blocks away from Montana Avenue, Fountain was arrested for attempting to rape a woman. In that case, Fountain had placed the woman inside a box and locked her inside a bathroom at her home. Fortunately, she managed to escape. Redmond said. Ironica and Redmond busied themselves digging further into Fountain's past and discovered he had been convicted in 1977 of killing a woman in New York City. We would not have known about the manslaughter conviction at the time of the Epps murder because the records weren't as easily available back then, Redmond said. A check of the New York State Sex Offender Registry revealed that he was convicted in 1984 for sexual attacks involving seven- and eight-year-old girls in the New York City area. Sometime later, Fountain moved from New York City to Buffalo because he had relatives here.
Redmond said, the detectives didn't have a hard time finding Fountain. He was at Central New York Psychiatric Center in Marcy, where he had been placed in indefinite civil confinement after he had completed his lengthy prison sentence on the attempted rape from 1994, and other charges. A judge agreed with the state's claim that he had a mental abnormality and, if released, would pose a threat to society. Obtaining a sample of his DNA to compare to the one found at the Epps crime scene was the next step. That also proved DG for the detectives. After Fountain's 1995 conviction on the felony attempted rape, a sample of his DNA was taken for a statewide criminal database. The results came back in October 2011. Lilly determined that the unidentified DNA taken from the Epps slaying matched Fountain's. Given what we now know about the Epps homicide, I believe this is proof that civil confinement works, Redmond said, who knows what could have happened if he had been released. Police are not saying much about Fountain's motive for allegedly killing Epps, but Ironica did say, it may have been an argument between the two of them. Two months ago, Redmond and Ironica interviewed Fountain at Marcy, and though the detectives declined to release the results of the interview, they said it went well. What surprised them was the manner in which Fountain conducted himself. A small man who presents himself as unassuming, Fountain was extremely polite, they said. The unexpected solving of the cold case has left the Epps family grateful that their daughter, sister and mother was not forgotten. This won't bring my sister back, and I will not be held hostage or victim for what he did to my sister, but I am very grateful to both detectives, said Depp's sister, Roxanne McKinney Cumberlander. Cumberlander added that when she saw Fountain in court last week, she realized he was a sick man. I forgive him and pray that he gets help and that God will save him, she said. Redmond said, the family's gratitude is overwhelming and makes our job meaningful. Fountain is now being held in the Erie County Holding Center, awaiting his next appearance before state Supreme Court Justice Penny Wolfgang. Fountain's court appearance was on the same day Ironica, a city officer for 40 years, celebrated his 60th birthday. This turned out to be a great birthday present, helping the Epps family get some closure, Ironica said. 10. Amy Widener Rodney Dink had kept his secret for more than two decades when a cold case detective approached Indianapolis Police Sergeant Bill Carter five years ago. The detective wasn't familiar with Facebook, and he asked for Carter's help to navigate through a page dedicated to the memory of Amy Widener. His interest in the case peaked. Carter eventually took it upon himself to investigate further. Last July, he found Amy Widener's killer by matching a bloody palm print left at the murder scene with Dank's prints from an old misdemeanor arrest. Carter, a detective with IMPD's Nuisance and Abatement Unit, solved the murder case, his first one ever, and brought closure to a family that had given up hope after more than two decades. Friday morning, he was in Marion Superior Court when Dank, 41, was sentenced to 65 years in prison. When I started looking at it, it actually wasn't assigned to anybody. Carter, a 14-year veteran with IMPD, said of the Widener case. So I picked it up and decided to look at it and see what I can figure out. When I talked to the mom for the first time, her mom was to the point where she kind of lost hope. That kind of motivated me. The first step was to follow up on an old lead, stereo equipment that belonged to the victim's older brother, John Paul Widener which was stolen from the Widener's house at the time of the murder, who knew the stereo was there. Carter said, the target always was thought to be her brother's friend because of the stereo equipment. The question then was, which friend? Carter ruled out friends who could not have been there or for whom there was no evidence of DNA or palm prints. Last June, he began interviewing neighbors who lived near the Widener's Southside home on East Terrace Avenue, where Amy Widener was killed the morning of November 13, 1989. One former neighbor gave a list of names of people who might know something. One of them was Denk, a friend of the Widener's. Two weeks later, on June 27, 2012, Carter went to Dink's house on the south side to talk to him about the case, but he was not there. Later that day, Dink called Carter to meet with him that Sunday. The day of the meeting, Dink was nowhere to be found. His mother said he left earlier that week. The next day, Carter obtained a hard copy file on Dink's 1997 theft arrest and matched his prints. Police were later able to trace a rental car to Dink, who was staying at a friend's house on the east side. When police confronted him, Dank cut his wrist and took a knife to his throat. Dank, who was 18 at the time of the murder, 
was charged last July. Police said Dink had gone to the Widener's house to burglarize it but was surprised to find that Amy Widener had stayed home to take care of her sick two-year-old daughter, Emily. Deputy Prosecutor Denise Robinson said Dink brought a pipe and struck the victim with it. After she confronted him, Dank then followed her to the bedroom where he raped and strangled her. He admitted to the crime in a plea agreement with prosecutors. When he appeared in court Friday morning, Dank was quiet and limited his answers to yes and no. We don't have it in our hearts to forgive you. Amy's memory will be honored and we will never have any thoughts of you. Gloria Widener told Dink on the stand. You took away our sense of security and betrayed our friends and your friends, who are one and the same. As a teenager, Dink was one of John Paul Widener's best friends. And even after the sentencing hearing, Amy Widener's family couldn't look at Dink as anyone else other than a former family friend. I thought I was going to see a monster, but who I saw was Rodney, Gloria Widener said after the hearing. For 23 years, 7 months and 1 day, we believed a stranger had come into our home, not someone they knew. If it's someone else, you can make him into a monster, John Paul Widener said. But someone you knew, I don't know. I can't process it yet. About 20 family members and friends attended the sentencing hearing. Most of them cried as Gloria Widener read her statement on the stand. At her request, a bailiff walked over to the defendant's table and showed Dink a picture of Amy Widener. Dink looked at it briefly and said nothing. Dink was sentenced to 50 years for the murder charge and 15 years for the rape charge. Both sentences will be served consecutively. Addressing Carter, who also was at the hearing, Judge Curtis Gruber said Amy Widener's family will be forever indebted to him. A family friend later approached Carter outside the courtroom, thanked him and gave him a hug. You're a hero. The family friend told Carter. I got lucky, Carter said. It's not a big deal, 